Hello there, just before we get into today's video, why not check out a new channel from me called War of Graphics? Want to know all the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics. From Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa, if it's got people fighting each other, we'll cover it. There is a link below. I hope to see you over there. And now, today's video. Today's video is sponsored by Backblaze. Get a 15-day free trial to back up your files at backblaze.com forward slash megaprojects. More about them in a bit. From the small cockpit of his vehicle, Andy Green is jetting along in silence, traveling faster than sound. All of a sudden, there's a boom. At that moment, his team knew that they'd accomplished their mission. His vehicle wasn't some government-funded, top-secret weapon, futuristic craft, or even the Batmobile. But at a glance, it's just a couple of jet engines bolted onto a dart, led by a man with an obsession and drive to be fastest. Through applied engineering, technology, and a spirit for adventure, this project carried a passion that eclipsed a mere desire. With funding issues, flared tempers, and an American team hot on their heels, this project was almost too ridiculous to be a reality. This is the story of Thrust SSC, the Super Sonic Car. The story of Thrust SSC, or Supersonic Car, starts from looking in the record books. Their land speed record is the highest speed achieved for a person using a vehicle on land. This was always a pastime of the rich and eccentric. Since the late 19th century, daredevils took to their own homemade or modified vehicles to barrel along a closed road or barren desert as fast as they could. There had been many people to claim the title of fastest person on land with a high-speed car. One of them was Richard Noble, who in 1983 took the land speed record with his car Thrust 2 by reaching a speed of 634 miles per hour or 1,020 kilometers an hour. After celebrating his achievement, it was discovered that if the car had gone a mere 7 miles per hour faster, it would have taken off and killed Noble. Despite this unknown brush with death, Noble may have been fast, but not fast enough. Noble had bigger ambitions. He wanted to go supersonic and would spend the next decade finding a way to do it. As Richard Noble put it, producing a car that could go supersonic safely is the greatest element of the land speed record, the equivalent of the sub four minute mile in athletic terms. With this mission statement, he had a dream of creating a legend. The first main obstacle in breaking the sound barrier in a car was, well, money. With this being a private venture, Noble had to finance the project himself, deploying his gift for the gab and negotiating techniques. He was helped along by sponsorship deals, but these would only carry the car so far. If Noble was going to break the sound barrier, he would have to be as cost-effective as he possibly could. Once he had the backing of companies like Castrol and Dunlop, he could start looking into the design. It would take a little more than just having a rocket with a cockpit slapped onto it for this to work. He needed something more extravagant. Not only that, but it also need the right designer. Luckily for Noble, in 1992, there was somebody who had all the qualities for such a task. Ron Hayes, a retired missile scientist, was approached by Noble to design his car. I's first thoughts were, this is totally impractical, don't even try it. So, some encouraging words there for him. He only continued to work on the project out of sheer curiosity. If a car was to travel supersonically, what would it look like? Some good old-fashioned British ingenuity and, well, sheer lunacy were needed to overcome obstacles not met with a normal car. The risk factor in taking a car supersonic is the danger that it's going to flip into the air unless the aerodynamics dictated that it would stay on the ground and not take off when traveling at speeds over 700 miles per hour or 1,127 kilometers an hour. This would be very difficult considering that the amount of power needed to get a car up to those speeds is usually reserved for jet powered planes. I started working on a design, and quite a design it was. He sketched out a jet black 10 ton behemoth. A tapered front nose flanked by two cylinders containing the jet engines with a long thin tail and an odd wheel arrangement underneath. The car would be 54 feet long, that's 16 and a half meters, 12 feet wide, that's 3.66 meters, and 7 feet, that's 2.14 meters high. This design also helped the aerodynamic properties required to stop it from taking off, and the faster the car went, the more stable it would actually become. Ace made some computer simulations of his proposed design to see what would happen when the car got up to speed. Now, this sounds 
perfectly ordinary today, but do remember this was the early 90s and it took weeks to complete this complex modeling. But the wait was worth it. The modeling showed the car would survive travel at supersonic speeds. Not only that, but a huge wall of energy would build up in front of the car and it would stay on the ground. Exactly where it needed to be. However, with this encouraging data, and always the practical man, Ayes wanted a more solid way of seeing if his design was going to work. In May 1994, a scale model of thrust was blasted down a track at supersonic speeds. The test, with a combination of high-speed photography and sensor data from the model, gave Ayes all the data he needed to see if his design would work. Only if the results matched with the computer modeling could construction of thrust SSC begin. Upon correlating all of the data together, Isa said that this was the only time in his entire life that he yelled out, Eureka. The data matched perfectly. Thrust would be able to withstand supersonic velocity. After two and a half years of research, design, and models, construction finally began. The parts needed for Thrust had to be sourced and found. However, with this being a small independent project, the parts were sourced by Noble and his team from just about anywhere they could find them. Noble had to deploy all of his bargaining techniques to acquire the parts they needed if his dream was going to ever become a reality. First of all, they needed a couple of engines. Luckily for the thrust team, the Royal Air Force RAF, had a couple of Rolls-Royce Spey 202 jet engines from an F-4 Phantom II jet fighter just knocking about that they managed to get for a discounted price. These two engines provided the power for thrust. Just how much power, though, is mind-boggling, and a ridiculous 110,000 brake horsepower or 82 megawatts were delivered. To put that into some perspective, that's about as much power as a thousand family cars. These engines would burn through 18 liters or four gallons of fuel per second. All right, we'll get back to today's video in just a second. But first, here's a quick word from today's fantastic sponsor, Backblaze. The best way to back up all of your files is with Backblaze. As you guys know, I like to trial the sponsors that we have on this show, and indeed today's sponsor, I'm using right now, both as I record this video and as you watch it. That's because in the background over there, my computer is just quietly backing up all of my recorded stuff and files to Backblaze's servers, which is amazing. Now, fortunately, touch wood, not had to call on Backblaze yet, but I do know that if I ever have a hard drive failure or anything like that, I can just go to Backblaze and I can say, hey, can I have my files back? And they'll be like, yes, Simon, you can absolutely have your files back. They'll ship you out a hard disk or you can download it if you've got a fast connection. It's all very easy. And by the way, they've restored more than 55 billion files. So how reliable are these guys? Well, they currently have two full exabytes of data stored and protected on their servers. Now you're probably wondering yourself, well, what is an exabyte? Well, it's basically two billion gigabytes, which is a mental statistic. So yes, they're the best. They'll back up your stuff and let you access it from anywhere in the world. Or if you like, they'll, as I said, mail you a disk with your files on it should you need it. Backblaze is also unlimited. There are no additional charges or fees, and it provides peace of mind for Wait for it, $7 a month, unlimited backup. I don't know how they do it. Right now, you guys can enjoy a fully featured 15 day, no credit card required free trial at bagblaze.com forward slash mega projects. And this deal is just in time for World Backup Day, which is March the 31st. Thank you, Backblaze. And now today's video. The engines may have made the car drunk with power, but they also caused a colossal headache for the team. Because of their weight, thrust would weigh in at 10.5 tons, or about 23,000 pounds. The car couldn't use normal wheels with rubber tires because of the huge speeds that it'd be traveling at. This meant that the car needed large metal front wheels in order to steer. To solve this problem, wheel and brake designer Glyn Bauscher came up with an extraordinary solution. He put the steering wheels for thrust at the back of the car. However, some people doubted that rear wheel steering was going to work for this car, and one of those doubters was Noble, who wasn't keen on having his potentially record-breaking car have dodgy steering. To put everyone's mind at ease, Bauscher built a demonstration vehicle to drive and show that the rear wheel steering would totally work. With the help of his brother-in-law and using his 30-year-old Mini, they converted it to have rear-wheel steering. Not only that, but the rear-wheel plan for the converted Mini was a full-scale version of thrusts. The wheels were not directly in line with each other, but slightly off at an angle. This allowed the steering to work and for it to fit into the narrow body of the 
supersonic car. Once Bowser conducted some tests in his Frankenstein Mini, Noble and the rest of the team were happy for Thrust to have the bonkers steering. Two widely spaced wheels at the front and two close together at the back was the final configuration. Other elements of the car were its six onboard cameras to record every aspect, two computers to run all the various instruments and provide as much data as possible for the team when conducting test runs. Now this all sounds relatively straightforward today, but again remember that this was the mid-90s. There weren't GoPros. There weren't smartphones. To cram that much technology in while operating on a tight budget was a colossal undertaking. The engines weren't the only thing Noble got from the RAF. He needed a driver. Driving a car at supersonic speeds is a task that Noble could not take on himself. To find the right man for the job, an open invitation was set up by Noble. Of the potential drivers, many of them had backgrounds piloting fighter jets for the Royal Air Force. From a list of 29 applicants, RAF fighter pilot Wing Commander Andy Green got the job to get the car past the sound barrier. In autumn 1996, Thrust SSC was complete, but they were still weeks behind schedule. Testing could begin, but they had to get a move on. The team would have to test everything the jet engines, parachutes, computers, cameras, communication equipment. Once these were complete, Thrust could be taken to the Black Rock Desert in Nevada to see what it was truly capable of. Thrust could not be tested in the Black Rock Desert at this time because it was flooded in the summer. So in spring 1997, Thrust and the team traveled to the Al Jaffa Desert in Jordan. On the suggestion of an enthusiast of the land speed record, it was quickly recruited by the team to do a spot of boating. And don't worry, we'll expand on that later. During Thrust's first runs in Jordan, the main aim was to get the car up to 600 miles per hour, that's 956 kilometers an hour. By reaching this goal, it would show the team how the car handles and if it was a viable candidate for the battle in America. It may sound a tad dramatic to say that this small British team was in a battle against the sound barrier, but it was more than that. They also had a rival. An American team, led by their driver, the 60-year-old racer Craig Breedlove, and his car, which was subtly named Spirit of America Sonic 1. They had the same goal as Noble, wanting to be the first to go supersonic on land. He was well on his way to realizing his ambition. The team were already ahead of Team Thrust, with Breedlove's car coming within 100 miles per hour of the sound barrier. At the time, this was speeds the British could only dream of. Luckily for the Thrust team, however, Breedlove's car suffered damage in a crash, and this brought them valuable time to test their car more. Not that the team had much time to play with. Summer was on its way in the desert, and soon it would be far too hot to test the car. It was a race in more than one sense. Here, the tiny crew could hopefully iron out kinks before any land speed records attempts. And that's if the money held out. As I mentioned, the budget of thrust was always a concern, but here are some examples of how cost-cutting the project was. The mobile command center was converted from a supermarket delivery truck. The supersonic car itself was not housed within some specialist mobile hangar, just in a large tent. Many of the team were using their holiday from real jobs to be a part of Thrust team. Not only that, but the team relied on land speed record enthusiasts to help clear the track for Thrust, all in the name of breaking the land speed record. The tracks for Thrust were white lines painted 50 feet or 15.2 meters apart and 10 miles 16 kilometers long. This was achieved by Andy Green pulling double duty, driving a pickup truck in a straight line with another member of the team on the back, letting out a jet of paint. This may sound mundane, but driving in a straight line in a blazing hot desert with no frame of reference is an incredibly mentally taxing task. However, once the tracks were painted, the test runs could begin. These initial runs of the car were just to see if everything was working correctly. The main concern was if the rear steering would work as the speed climbed. Because of this, the first test run was only planned to be a mere 140 miles per hour, far from the ultimate goal of 760 miles per hour. With Andy Green in the cockpit, Thrust's engines roared and propelled the car along to a speed just over 140 miles per hour. A successful test run for the car, however, Green did have some difficulty in steering. The team back in the delivery truck examined the data from the onboard computers and footage from the run to see what was happening to the steering. The footage revealed something the car should not be doing. It was beginning to take off. It was only by a few millimeters, but this was really concerning. This was confirmed when the tracks from the car were visually inspected and there was a six feet gap in the trails that were left on the desert floor. Another bit of unease was that thrust was leaving deep grooves in the desert surface with the rear wheels twisting on the desert floor. Due to the thrust being designed to run on the dried up lake bed of Black Rock and not the smooth desert floor of Jordan, it meant that the car needed to be modified for this service, but they could not change the weight of the car, so, well, this annoyance just had to be tolerated. Due to these deep ruts left in the desert surface, thrust could not run on the same track twice. If the car was to run over one of these ruts, it could potentially flip over. Data from the computers gave the workshop repair team a solution 
solution on how to stop the rear wheels twisting during runs. It was a quick fix, but on another run, the car performed better. Now they were ready for fast runs. As the days rolled on, heat in Jordan increased. This was becoming a problem, even causing one of the onboard computers to fail. During another fast test run, the steering was still an issue. The team could not work out the problem. The car's shape dictated that the faster it went, the more stable it would become. Their solution was to run the car faster and see what happens. After a faster run, the car was still wobbling around. The rear wheel steering was the problem here. Andy Green said that he was still learning the car and he'd get better over time. Upon further inspection, though, it was revealed that a piece of rear suspension had come off and nobody knew why. Despite the Jordanian desert doing its best to destroy the car, the team were determined to carry on and push the car to 500 miles per hour. With Green back in the cockpit, he pushed the car faster and faster. Dust began to fill up in the cockpit, warning lights flashing, alarms beeping frantically. He wrestled with the controls to keep the car stable. Just shy of 60 miles per hour of the team's goal of 500 miles per hour, there was a major suspension failure. Both of the wheel mounts had broken. This was serious. The damage was so severe that the battle with Breedlove at Black Rock was in jeopardy. With time and money running out, Noble gave the team two options. Fix the car in Jordan or go home. When the team voiced their concerns over funding, Noble, ever the optimist, simply said, I'll keep you going. The team were put in a difficult position. If they left Jordan with a broken car and inconclusive data, they may not be able to secure funding for the Black Rock runs. After assessing the time frame it would take to repair the car, it was decided that they had to go home. Thrust sat in its tent under the blazing desert sun, broken and beaten. A tremendous challenge faced the team. With Noble almost out of money and sponsorship cutting back, he would have to raise money any way he could. He auctioned off old parts of the car and went on a press store to raise any funds he could. Jordan may have taken its toll on thrust, but not on the man behind it. During the team's return to England, repairs had to be made to thrust. With a new computerized active suspension designed by Jerry Bliss, this system would raise the rear of the car and help keep the nose down. Hopefully, this would stop the car from taking off. Over at Black Rock, the rival American team had reached the unofficial speed of 670 miles per hour or 1,078 kph. Not without issue, though. The Spirit of America took off and went off course and onto its side, nearly crashing, but luckily it didn't. However, traveling at such high speeds is filled with danger, one that Breedlove experienced when, on his final run, he temporarily lost control of the car and it went over on its side, but he managed to regain control and avoid disaster. The nearby town of Garlach was where the teams would rest after each day out on Black Rock. However, it had only one motel, but on the plus side, it had five bars. Noble, still trying to keep the finances under control, rented a house for the team, but it wasn't furnished, so there were just mattresses tossed onto the floor. After five days, the base camp was assembled and Thrust was readied. The speed runs could begin. Before each run, the path for Thrust had to be cleared. This required two microlites to be flown above the desert to look for large debris that could cause damage or worst, the car. Any identified would be dealt with by teams on the ground. You may remember me mentioning the term foding. This is where a team on foot followed the pickup truck painting the tracks. Here they would look for small debris that wasn't spotted by the microlites. This is what foding is. It stands for foreign object damage. Before Thrust set off on its attempts to beat the sound barrier, Green visited his rival driver's camp. Pleasantries were exchanged, but this was to size up his rival that he towered over in stature. Breedlove's car was far more conventional than Thrust, with its single jet engine, traditional front steering, and conventional suspension. Green cited it as a lovely looking car and a superb piece of engineering. No way I could drive it. The cockpit is absolutely tiny. Designed around the man. Very well designed car. I wish him the very best because the last time he drove it, it was the fastest crash in land speed history. With his rival sized up and the 13 mile, 21 kilometer tracks painted, it was time to see what Thrust could do. With two potentially supersonic cars running on the lake bed, it was only safe to run one car at a time. Breedlove was up first. His run looked good, but on the return, he needed towing back. A piece of FOD was missed and it was sucked up into the air intake for the jet. The only repair was to put in a new engine. On hearing the news, the British team handled it with the grace and dignity that you might expect, and they burst out laughing. Day night at Black Rock was planned to be the first 600 mile per hour run using the full power of the afterburners. Green climbed into thrust for this attempted run. With the RF's Jane Millington in charge of communications, who happened to be Andy Green's girlfriend, she was the only one talking to him in the cockpit. Footage from the onboard cameras mounted on the rear wing caught the engine spitting out streams of fire. At 624 miles per hour, Green said over the mic, Comp one down. One of the computers that controlled the car had crashed. Thrust went in for repairs, but on the following days, the same thing happened. 
Then a dust storm stopped runs on the car, putting more strain on the finances of the project. At this point, Noble estimated that they were nearly half a million pounds in the red, and there is the mega project signature over budget. During this storm, a fix was found for the computers. The vibrations had shaken the chips from their sockets, so they just fixed them in tighter. Pretty low tech, but it totally worked. The next runs of the car were far more successful, clocking in at a speed of 721 miles per hour or 1,160 kilometers per hour. However, Thruster developed a new fault. The parachutes were not deploying properly. The drogue chutes would come out, but not pull the main chutes with them. The problem here was the chutes were from Thrust 2, and even then, they were second hands, another result of the cost cutting issues of the project. On day 22, the team loaded a ton of fuel and let Thrust off on another run. Here they reached 714 miles per hour, 1,149 kilometers an hour. When this run was completed, it was found a panel had blown off at 700 miles per hour. During repairs, photographs from the microlights were inspected from the run, revealing what the high speed was doing to the car. A wall of energy was building up in front of thrust, and it was starting to take off. Andy Green had an idea of how to stop the nose from lifting, do away with the computerized suspension, and run with the tail fully up. This was met with a response from Bliss, do what you f***ing like. Patience and tempers are apparently wearing thin. Day 30 of the project dawned, and they tested the suspension in the up position. However, Green's plan just pushed the front wheels into the desert. A compromise of active and lock suspension seemed to be the key to fixing the issue. After 36 days of black rock, the weather was worsening from dust storms to snow, not allowing the ground to dry out. The car was now showing its battle scars of the high-speed runs. Panels were so battered that every rivet needed checking after every outing. Many in the team were now doubting if their creation was capable of completing its mission. However, Noble and his team were determined to break the sound barrier. Day 40 began with a team member making an impossible call to his mother back in England to watch the television because they were going to try and beat the sound barrier that day. Thrust may have been battered and pushed to its limits, but the sound barrier was only a few miles per hour away. Andy Green climbed into Thrust and went for it, powering through the 100s of miles per hour and firing up the afterburners as the car was thrusting its way across the American desert. He wrestled with the controls to keep it on track. As one moment when Thrust was traveling at 650 miles per hour, 1,046 kilometers an hour, Green had the yoke at a full 90 degrees to the right in order to keep it on track. The car was veering to the left because of the wheel arrangement. At this moment, Green proved more than ever why he was chosen for the job. He throttled down the jets to rebalance the car, effectively steering the car with the throttle to get it back on course. It worked, and Green hit the reheat on the jets. From the team watching in the distance, they saw the black 10-ton arrow shoot across the desert in silence, a dust trail streaking behind it. And then there was a boom. Then another sound came that almost matched the boom, the team erupting in celebration. But the task wasn't done yet. They may have broken the sound barrier, but they had less than an hour to do another run to get the average speed needed to confirm that they had actually broken it. On Green's return run, he came back faster than ever, reaching a top speed of Mach 1.007. Unfortunately, they didn't turn the car around fast enough and missed the hour cutoff time by 50 seconds. This was a crushing blow for the team, but they soldiered on. At this stage, Thrust was requiring significant maintenance every run. The team had doubts that the car would survive to make history. But they knew the car was capable, and they weren't going to give up until Thrust wouldn't be able to run at all. On Wednesday, the 15th of October 1997, Thrust went out for one more run. The team was not going to be defeated. As the recovery team waited, they listened for the boom, and boy did they ever hear it. They rushed to recover Thrust and to turn it around in time. They went as fast as they possibly could, refilling the beast with a ton of fuel and checking every panel. Once this was done, Green set off again, and there was another boom. Noble waited impatiently at the base camp with a walkie-talkie in hand, waiting for the average speed to come through. With a speed of 763.035 miles per hour, or 1,128 kilometers an hour, they'd done it in time. And just like that, Thrust was in the history books. After making history, Thrust SSC was retired, and it resides with its sibling Thrust 2 in the Coventry Transport Museum in England, a testament to what is possible when there is passion and determination behind a project. However, unlike Concord or the Apollo program, the story isn't quite over for Richard Noble. But what is after the speed of sound? Well, it's not faster than light, that's for damn sure, but how about taking a car up to a thousand miles per hour? That's what the Bloodhound is tasked with. This could be the subject of another video, and if you're interested in that, Leave a comment below.
With his dedicated team around him, he accomplished his dream of breaking the sound barrier. To realize his vision, he gambled everything. There may have been engineering issues, budget worries, and at times flared tempers, but it was all in his quest to beat the sound barrier, and in the end, he won.